<laughs> All right. All right. So uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank both uh, Todd and Jim and Dan for popping in the meeting, uh, being guest speakers. It's great to have you. Um, we're supposed to have about seven participants, um, but this is the Associate Development Day Teaching and Coaching. We're going to be focusing on level three uh, information. And uh, this will be great for both level two and level one as they can see what uh, type of book work and information they need. Uh, but it's also just uh, using Jim's expertise uh, and his years of uh, teaching and coaching. He's been in the business for years and has a laundry list of accomplishments, but primarily he's the 2020 Player Development uh, Award winner, uh, which is uh, a very uh, big accomplishment and uh, just based upon the other seminars I've attended where he's been a guest speaker I've learned a, lo a ton of knowledge and helpful facts uh, to use in the future uh, during my teaching and coaching so uh, Jim if you'd like to take it away and sure uh, up into the first line of uh, information and then near the end everybody can uh, have a group discussion ask Jim and Dan questions and uh, we'll be we'll be all set but Jim if you want to begin sure floor is yours. Yeah. all right thanks Jeff for that uh, well folks it's 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 really an honor for me to talk to you I have uh, been in the golf business since 1991 so I'm an old guy but uh, I've got probably got kids your age uh, I mean, not quite. I have a 25 and a 23, but, but really, um, you know, the golf business um, has changed dramatically since I got in it. And really today, the purpose of this is just to give you some insight into, you know, from my background, I started as an assistant pro at a, at a private club. Um, that club you know, was in Baltimore, Bonnie View Club. And um, that was you know, a great experience, but uh, unfortunately that club shut down. And then um, I worked at another club for uh, five years as a, as assistant pro and my primary responsibilities were teaching and taking care of the inventory and all the things that golf professionals do uh, learning the business. Um, but really my focus after, um, you know, I came from a playing background, I was a pretty good player and um, I really got developed an interest in teaching. And so you know, I started off as a teacher that really back in the day, you know, like when I came up, it was pretty much no technology. And, you know, you gave 30 or one hour lessons for eight hours a day if you wanted to make a living. And I just decided that um, that was too difficult, right? So I thought, well, you know, how can I make people better? Well, the answer is I had to get a vision and a mission statement. So my mission was, you know, I wanted to make golf um, a lifelong activity for people and and give them the experience that I had and so how am I going to do that well um, my vision was really to to take care of the needs and the goals of the golfer that's in front of me and so I decided that uh, you know the model of just giving swing fixes over an hour period really wasn't fulfilling for me so I decided that I would go ahead and and try to make players better uh, players, right? So being a coach uh, really involves the psychological component, it involves the technical component, it also involves club fitting. So really as a comprehensive analysis, you really have to ask questions uh, of your players. And so um, what I decided to do was to create an improvement plan for people based on what I heard. So some of the questions I would typically ask them would be, okay, you know, why are you here? But more importantly, you know, how can I be of assistance to you? And obviously your demographic is going to make, make a difference. In other words, you know, whether you're at a private club or whether you're at a, you know, a driving range or you're at a part three course or whatever, but really you're dealing with people. And so, you know, you've got to get inside their head by asking good questions. And one of the things that I would do um, and what I would recommend for you guys is, is to really, um, inspire your players by asking them the right questions. Okay, so where's your game at? Where do you want to get to? Um, why do you want to get there? Um, and once you get those questions answered and you clarify uh, and you can answer the objections, um, 
you know, you're going to be able to formulate a plan. So, um, you know, when I talk about teaching philosophy, um, that's really a mission statement. You know, I started, like I said, as an assistant pro, and then I became a director of instruction um, at Olney Golf Park, and I've been there since 2001. Uh, and then I decided after 2008 that I wanted to have my own business. And so when you when you decide to, to have your own business, you do have to have a philosophy. And whether you're talking to someone that's never played the game or you're talking to a, you know, a high performance player, you know, how you talk to them and what you ask them um, really doesn't change all that much. Um, you know, if I'm talking to a tour player, you know, he'll say, um, or a, a college kid, he'll say, you know what, uh, you know, my goal uh, is to play better golf or, and finish in uh, and be, a, be in the top five. If I'm talking to a beginner player, um, it's the same thing. Maybe it's the difference is the competitive player, the high performance player wants to um, some more technical, maybe a little bit more mental. Um, but the beginner golfer might say, you know, I just need the basics and I want to just go out and have fun. Um, so, yeah, um, whether you're talking to a beginner or an advanced player, their needs might be different, but the questions you ask them aren't too much different. So for me, like I said, what I'll do is I want to make sure that I'm asking them, you know, where are you at? In other words, if you're a beginner golfer, have you played on the course? Um, have you just been to the driving range? How do you keep score? If you're an advanced player, or even a tour player, you know, I might ask them, um, do you keep statistics? Do you have tracking information on your stats? Do you keep your putts, your greens and regulation, your proximity to the hole? Um, if it's a very beginner golfer, you know, I might say, okay, um, if you've never played on the course um, today, um, if you, if we were having a conversation at the end of this day, what would you want to have happen for you to be happy with your golf game? Something like along those lines. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, whether it's a beginner or not, you've got to get inside their head. You've got to say to them, you know, what are your goals? Why, 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 why are you here? More importantly, the why is a big, big answer, because if you can get to the emotion, they might say, man, you know, I tried this golf and I just, it's really frustrating. And I, and I just don't, I don't want to play unless I can play it and not embarrass myself. Oh, great. Okay. So let's formulate a plan. I'll do an analysis and assessment of your game and we'll go from there. So that's sort of how I do it. Um, the first part of the process is really asking a bunch of questions. You know, um, I might even go through a physical screen with them, you know, uh, have them, you know, if you guys have done TPI or not, um, if they've had major medical injuries, so on and so forth. So the question is, while working with both competitive and recreational golfers, what areas of the mental game do you focus on? Well, for me, you know, if it's a very beginning person, what I want to do is set their expectations. So one of the things I'll do with a very beginner golfer is I might say, you know what, Joyce, today all I want to do is hit the ball. I just want you to hit it. And then if you can hit it, we want to get it in the air. And then if you get it in the air, we want to hit it to a target. That's our goal today. So set the expectation level of the player. Um, as a coach, it's really important to do that because, look, most people – expectations are way out of in line are not in line with the amount of time and effort they put into the game so that's that's a big part of the mental game because you know people whether you, whether they realize it or not many times think that there's a correlation between practice and performance so you go out there and you spend two hours hitting balls and suddenly man you know what i put in the time and effort i should be a good golfer not necessarily the case you know we see the average score uh, hasn't really gone down much in, in golf. And the reason is people don't really know how to practice. So in terms of the mental game, I'll have my players, whether it's a beginner or not, I'll take a video of what they do. And I might say, here, let's look at this video of you hitting golf balls. And they'll go, wow, I'm just scraping balls over and I'm hitting them with no thought. 
Exactly. Exactly. You, you don't, you're not really thinking about target. You're not really thinking about, you know, where the, the club or the type of shots you're going to hit or none of that stuff. So, so really getting them to pay attention to that and getting them. That's why when I set up golf balls, whether it be on the driving range, and that's why I think every kid or every beginner um, needs to go to a golf course. I mean, they got to get familiarized with what it's like to make decisions on a golf course. So um, what areas of focus on the mental game? Well, like I was saying, the pre-shot routine, how are they reacting when they hit a bad shot? Are they emotionalizing that? Or have they got an expectation level that's not in line? So if you're getting mad or kids are getting mad, um, we got to set their expectation level. Um, you know, if there's a, a college player that keeps hitting every shot perfectly uh, and, and, and as an instructor, you ask the guy, okay, you want to see the ball turn right to left five, 10 yards, um, and you're hitting at the right ball flight and you're hitting at the right distance. Um, and then he'll say to me, well, how come I can't do that on the, in the tournament? And I'll say to you, how many times do you put yourself in that under pressure when you practice? Um, are you playing for big stakes? Are you playing under pressure in your practice? Or are you just going out there in a non-threatening environment and hitting shots? Okay. When you use mental practice, when do you use mental practice in relation to physical practice? Well, you know, what I believe on this is they should be used, you know, if it's a technical swing change, there's sort of four levels of, of, of learning. There's unconscious incompetence, which means you really are, as an instructor, you got to tell them what they're doing wrong because they have no idea what they're doing. And then this, the, this, the second level is conscious competence, which means they're consciously aware that they're not any good, but they know that they at least have the knowledge. And then, you know, they can de determine the difference between the good swing and the bad swing. Well, when do you do that and how do you do it? You have to set up feedback. Augmented feedback is an environment where you're not hitting balls and there's no target. So, you know, you might have a, you might take a, a phone and put it on a tripod and practice your swing on a phone without a golf club, you know, just taking your grip, setting up, getting in your posture, you know, depending on what you're working on, that's the first level of practice. And then taking a golf club and doing it would be the second level. Um, and then putting your body in a position so that you're accessing the, the, the motor pattern that you're trying to, that you're trying to learn. So, Mental practice is being able to performance practice and then technical practice. So performance practice is simulating the environment under which you're about to, to play. And so that's a different state of mind. You're, you're going to call up a shot you've hit well. You're going to feel the swing. You're going to verbalize the shot you want to hit. And then you're going to get over the ball and you're going to think about the target. And you're not going to think about how to swing. But when you're working on a technical part of the swing, you need feedback and you need to know, hey, this is the right position and this is the wrong position. So, you know, when you get into a state of mastery, like most of you guys, you've played the game for long periods of time and you've spent a lot of time, you can just flip a switch and you, and, and you can hit shots and you're not really thinking about it. Um, the problem is when we get under pressure, we try to consciously interrupt those thoughts with conscious thoughts about how to swing. And so that's when things go awry. Um, so what mental practice speed should you use on your students for both golf skills and procedural skills? Well, like I was saying, I think you should do it slowly without a club and with a club. And then once you get some confidence on what it feels like, and you can recall that feel and you, you can actually move through space in slow motion and, and get a concept of, okay, this is what it feels like, this is where I want it, then you can start to hit some shots. So, you know, the problem with, with learning a new motor pattern is many times when you hit it at speed, um, your old pattern kicks in, or under pressure, your old pattern kicks in. So you might be able to hit great shots in front of your coach, and then you get into the member guest, or you get into a match play environment or you get in a tournament and suddenly you just recruit the old swing, the old pattern. 
and that's pretty typical. Um, so, you know, I, um, I hope I'm answering that question for you guys. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but you know, the mental practice, I think I can relate to this. The one tournament I won on the, on the nationwide tour back in, back when I played, it was the, uh, uh, Nike tour back in 96. I sat up, uh, at night and I closed my eyes and I tried to picture myself playing these shots and hitting the shots exactly how I wanted to hit them. And um, I spent a lot of time doing that um, because I knew I was going to get really nervous the last day. And so that was the process by which I went through it. When I got into on the golf course that last round, um, I tried to picture myself hitting that shot. And what's interesting, I was able to stay in the process and everything slowed down for me and I was able to execute and do it. But, you know, after talking to really high level players, I do realize that not even the best players in the world can do that every, every time they get in contention. And so when you consider the best player that ever lived, maybe Tiger Woods is only one thirty percent of the time. Um, I've heard many really good players when I played on the PGA tour in 98, tell me that, you know, it took me a while before I was able to get under pressure and actually execute and, and win a tournament. I remember uh, Tom Watson, I played a practice round with him and he said to me, you know, the first three times I got the lead in the U S open going into the last round, I shot, I shot terrible and, and, and lost the tournament. So, you know, there's, a, there's a learning curve in, and uh, getting comfortable in that environment uh, takes time. So um, uh, that's why, you know, when you have a beginner um, and, and, and they're starting to get frustrated um, or maybe they're seeing some success, and, but it's not transferring to the golf course, you have to explain to them the reasons, the reasons why that's the case. Okay, so evaluating a motor imagery level. I love this. Um, Dr. David Wright um, is, is a guy that I, I worked with when I was playing, and um, he got me involved in a book called Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, and one of the things that he said was, um, how are you going to react to a situation that's completely unforeseen and awful? So he would say, okay, you, you started off 8-6 the first two holes, tell me what you're going to shoot. And uh, he would have me go through this pre-shot routine that involved seeing the target, feeling the swing, and verbally verbalizing, calling up the shots. And he developed this, this process by where he said, I want you to journal your good shots and call them up. So in a practice round, I would hit shots, and I would rate them on a scale of one to – well, one to five. And if I saw the image throughout my swing, it would be somewhere around a four or a five. If I lost the image on my backswing, right away is a one. If I got to the top of my backswing or even short of the top of my backswing and I lost the image, it was a two and so on and so forth. And I saw into the entire swing, it was a five. And so that was another way for me to deal with pressure. It was another way for me to practice. Um, and so, you know, if you can practice that by just staring at an object, taking some deep breaths and seeing how long you can hold an image of that target or that object in your mind. And the, the quality of that image, um, your visual system will tell your hands and arms what to do with time that you can give yourself good quality image. <clears throat> so that's a really, um, I think it's a really good skill. I think, I know Jack Nicholas talks about it. Um, uh, yeah, he's a visual learner and Tiger talks about it. Nicholas is big into imagery and visualizing his shots. And I remember Tiger talking about it too. So yeah, I think that skill uh, using the right side of your brain, which is your you know, the side you want to be using when you're playing the game, the left brain or the prefrontal cortex, which is judgment. Um, you know, when we get under pressure, we don't make good judgments, right? So 
you know, you might just hit a ball in the water, right? And instead of going to the drop area, uh, you tee up another one and hit it in the water. And you could have gone up 100 yards and teed off. Um, so um, having this system of where you can image shots and have a process when things break down is really helpful under pressure. Okay. How do you start – um, how do you start off your lesson to find information about your students? Well, so like I, we started a nonprofit uh, to help combat wounded um, people post 9-11 use golf in their rehabilitation process. So um, many times, um, you know, and in 14 years, we've never had anyone get hurt while working with them, but you really have to probe. Um, so if somebody has some sort of physical limitation, um, and they say, and most people will say, oh yeah, I never had a surgery. Um, you know, I'm fine. Uh, you know, okay. Um, why don't you walk 20 yards for me? Right. And, and you watch their gait pattern, right. And you say, uh, you know what? You're limping your right leg, uh, your right hip. Do you have something wrong with that hip? And they'll say, oh yeah. Um, this hip's been bothering me or whatever. So um, even though they might say, you know what, I don't have any physical limitations when you watch them swing or when you watch them. So it's, uh, you know, walk or, 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 you know, do any sort of activity. It's good to do some sort of assessment. Um, so, um, you know, if you have a person that, for example, lost one of his legs, um, let's say it's a trail leg. Um, well, then you know that uh, it, depending on the length of the amputation, if it's above the knee or below the knee, um, their balance is going to be affected. So um, you might ask them, um, you know, what sort of rehab have you been doing? Um, are there any other injuries? And, you know, so a lot of times they just aren't going to tell you, um, but you need to, you need to screen them. You know, and you can do quick screens, a balance screen. You can do a rotational screen. You can tell them to lift their left arm above their left shoulder. Can they keep their arms straight? Um, have them move their wrists back and forth. Have them rotate their hands and arms this way for shoulders. Have them do a 90-90 test this way. Have them rotate their trunk and then rotate their hips, all sorts of stuff. And then again, you know, like this is saying, you got to find out where, where they're at. Okay, where are you right now? Where do you want to get to? And why do you want to get there? Um, you know, and you can ask them all sorts of stuff. Uh, are you a good shooter? Um, have you played other sports like basketball or things that involve um, a racket? Uh, all that stuff. But it's real good to get a comprehensive look at their skills. So um, not only do you have to do the physical screen, not only do you have to, you know, say to them, um, give them their expectation levels, but you also have to ask them other sports related questions too. Uh, you know, like uh, many of the guys I work with in the military haven't been exposed to golf, but they're physically really gifted. I mean, they're great shooters, they're marksmen. Um, and a lot of the special forces guys um, are in great physical shape. Um, and uh, a lot of, a lot of the military guys um, have been trained on uh, how to stay focused under intense uh, pressure. So they, a lot of them have a lot of this, the skills that um, you're looking for um, when you're trying to coach somebody. But yeah, disabilities, um, I don't like to use that word, ability, a disability. I would just say it's a physical challenge. I've seen people with one leg play golf better than people with two legs and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, what short game specialty shots are most important to understand for future instruction? Um, I would say it depends on what skill level you're playing with, but for the, uh, or you're working with, but for the most part, you know, make the shot simple and get them using a club that's going to involve uh, some roll. So it might be a nine iron, an eight iron, and you might explain to them, you know, an eight iron is going to roll, if you carry it five, it's going to roll 15. A pitching wedge, if you carry it five, it's going to roll five or uh, roll 10. And a sand wedge is going to carry five and roll five. So, um, you know, 
get him to use a chip putt. Um, so that would be my, my uh, most important thing. And then putting, I, I would, I would do a putting assessment, you know, have them hit putts from four feet, count how many they make out of 10, then have them play nine holes and have them putt to different uh, between 20 and 40 feet and see what they shoot. Or, or, you know, if you don't have time to do nine holes, maybe do three or four holes. Um, what unusual conditions to plan are key to discuss and have knowledge on for the future? Well, you, in the assessment, put them on a downslope, put them on an upslope, um, give them a club and say, okay, I want you to hit this ball a hundred yards in the air out of the rough. Which club would you use? Um, <laughs> that's usually funny. I mean, I have people that, uh, even they're good golfers, you know, I give them a lie and they'll say, Oh, I can hit that over the water. And we have a, we have an Island green at, at only golf park. And, and I'd say, okay, uh, go for it. You know, I put them in a down slope, slight down slope out of the rough and 10 balls later, they still haven't hit it over the water. So, um, and then they blame their, their swing, right? Well, it's not really the swing, right? It's just a bad decision. Um, because you just don't have enough club head speed to get the ball, to hit the ball that far. Um, and so on a down slope, they might not change their attack angle. They might, not, they might lean back. There's all sorts of stuff. So, um, but I would spend for beginners, I would, or any player, I would spend a lot, vast majority of, of my time with finesse wedges, uh, chips, and putting the first 20 to 30 minutes to see what level they're at. I think that's hugely important. And, you know, in my experience, I changed my business model from one where I was fixing swings to, to like I said, coaching. And I, I love putting people in groups. And the reason I say that is because if you're in a group, you're going to push each other to play better. You're building a, uh, a connection with somebody else. And, you know, as golf professionals, you know, I, I didn't like working seven days a week. So I got to the point where, you know what, I'm going to work with teams of four. I'm going to charge less money and make more money and see my, see my clients every week. So I had good client retention. I changed my business model from a, fit, a swing fixer to a, a coach. And, and, you know, my programs are three, six and, and a year. It's cheap. And I get to play with the players I get to be with them. They enjoy going out on the golf course at least once every two weeks. And I get to spend time with my family. So if I was a young pro and I was starting my own business, I wish I'd have known that at the very beginning. Um, of course, back when I started, you know, we didn't know any of this stuff. And, um, you know, you just work 60 hours a week and that was just the way you did it. And, you know, uh, that gets old. I sort of, that's a little off topic, but yeah, I think that's important to know. In your opinion, how can a professional become a better teacher? Podcasts, absolutely. You know, uh, Golf Science Lab, Brett, Dr. Brett McCabe. Uh, uh, you know, I would look at Greg Carlin's stuff. I would look at, um, you know, the other thing I would do is I would look at in the business world uh, and I would look at um, folks that are trained to uh, teach entrepreneurs how to how to sell or or make more money um, through um, that avenue. I think has helped me more than anything um, as far as like how to talk to people, um, how to present. Um, that's really important. Videos for sure. Uh, you know, I would be careful on what I what what I looked at. But I would get as much information as I could through video. I, I really believe that um, you got to understand the, the person in front of you. So the context with which you watch videos and, you know, there's, there's great information, but it's not for everybody. But I think as a professional, you need to get as much information as you can. And what I would say is go to someone who you don't agree with. Go to someone who you think has no idea how to teach, and you might find that their teaching methods are better, uh, get, get just as good of uh, results as yours, even though it's not the same method um, or even the same information. Yeah, I mean, going to seminars uh, is hugely important. But like I said, like 
I'm always trying to find podcasts um, on, 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 uh, you know, not just golf. Like I said, I'm looking at telling a story, Donald Miller. That's a great book. Storytelling. How are you getting your, you know, like how are people relating to you? How are you going to get people to, to buy into you? And that is, and the answer is you got to tell compelling stories. Um, you know, instances where, you can say to this person, look, I had this person, Kevin, and you know, when we first started 16 months ago, he was shooting 130 and now he's shooting 85. Let me tell you a story about how one day he had three pars or whatever, you know? So how you tell stories and how you relate to your people is huge. Um, and again, I would encourage everybody to go to as many seminars or, or, uh, find people like I work with, uh, Will Robbins. Will Robbins is with RGX, revolutionizing golf instruction. And I started three years ago and we get on a call every three times a week. And uh, we just talk about everything about business, not only about teaching, but about business, uh, you know, how to run your business more effectively. Um, and then, you know, research is great, but I think, I think we can get a little bit too far down that research road. Um, again, if you're with a beginner, you just want to teach them how to love the game. You don't need to, you don't need to give them the research on how to swing the golf club. I think it's good for, for high, you know, high level players, but I would say this about um, becoming a better professional. How are you going to get that kid, that kid that can't swing, that doesn't play golf well, he's not an athlete. How are you going to get him to love golf? Cause remember only 10% of the population plays golf. And so I would encourage you, do you give that person, that, that, that kid that is, is not very good uh, an opportunity to enjoy the game through strategy or through choice, player interaction? How are you going to get that kid to, to love the game? And that's, that's really the question that I have for everybody. So when you're doing kids programming, find things that appeal to everybody, not just the best players. And don't always let the best player win you know let some you know figure out a strategy where um some of the the kids that aren't the best players are winning um what's the purpose what is the purpose and goals for an effective club fitting uh, uh yeah we could um yeah turn this portion over to uh dan uh it, this is the area that i had him uh available to but if you wanted to put some insight into it as well, I see uh, Dan's currently in the car, so I don't want to distract him. Um, and uh, oh, he, he's joining in now. Yeah, how's it uh, going, Dan? I was good, good. Um, I was gonna say, if Jim, again, Jim, great, great uh, seeing you again. Yeah. Jim, Jim just keep going and uh, not throw in if uh, if there's anything you know else, but if you can keep leading us. Okay. Yeah. I mean, club right. fitting's huge. Thanks, uh, yeah. I mean, if the toe of the club is, if you're five foot six and you're playing with a standard link club and you, you know, you're starting to stand in a different way because the club is too long for you, you're standing too far away from it. Um, you know, then you got to look at getting that club modified to fit that person. Um, one thing I've learned through club fitting is, um, you know, most clubs are too heavy for people and they don't have enough loft. Um, and the other thing I, I think is really important, that I was listening to a club fitting seminar the other day by Patrick Benningfield over at Bethesda, and he's, he tested clubs from the factory, and he said that clubs that are too upright are worse for you than having clubs that are, that are flatter. And if a club is two degrees too upright, the ball's gonna go offline something like 15 yards. Whereas if you have a club that's two degrees too flat, it's only going to go off uh, flying like seven yards. So club fitting is huge when you're good enough to hit the ball reasonably close to the center of the club. Um, and you're a decent – now, when I say club fitting, I mean lie angle. Um, but, yeah, length. So length, lie, you know, shaft, how the shaft is performing. You know, if you got a golf club – that's too heavy and too stiff, the ball flight's gonna go too low. Uh, so you gotta take a look at that. If you have a person that's um, hitting a driver 
with too much spin, um, you got to look at loft and shaft flex, and you also have to look at angle of attack. Uh, are they hitting down on it too much? And so, you know, there's no such thing as really lie boards anymore. When I started, we had tape and lie boards, and I don't really use that stuff anymore. Um, but again, if you see a guy that's hitting it left, and he says, look, you know, every shot I hit is 20 yards to the left, then that golf club's too upright. And uh, so, you know, you got to make that adjustment. And that's pretty simple. Two to two or three degrees, most people can make that lie angle change. Uh, most golf pros can do that if you have a bending machine right there. Um, putter fittings are really important too because you got to, you know, when you're looking at a golf club like a putter, you have to you have to figure out if the person can aim the putter first. You have to figure out, you know, like do they like lines on a putter? What is their stroke path? Are they arcing it? Are they taking it back straight? Do they open the face a lot or not? So if you have a person that is rolling the face wide open, you might want to put them in something with a face balance putter, uh, something like a mallet. Um, if you have persons that just remember this, if you have an offset putter and you have a face balance putter with a lot of offset, the aiming tendencies are more left. You're going to hit it more to the left. Uh, or you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna aim left and hit it left. So again, you got to look at how they aim the club with the putter, um, and you know, with 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 uh, the other thing with the putter is you got to get that putter to uh, to fit in terms of uh, some people like a heavy grip, some people like a light grip, some people like a heavy head. So you have to really figure out what that customer in front of you or that purpose person in front of you is what appeals to them. Some people are not linear. Some people don't like lines on a putter. I know Ben Crenshaw doesn't use a line on his putter. He, so these are sort of the things that I look at. Um, well, one of the things I wanted to add real quick, like was the first question on that slide. Yeah. Is, is pretty much in line what you've been talking about with uh, coaching is you know, setting goals. Right. Uh, during that initial, thing, you know, ask them what, what, what are we trying to achieve here? Right. Yes, if, if anybody uh, couldn't, uh, you kind of cut out, Dan, but uh, what he mainly said was, what are you trying to achieve? In your fitting, what are you trying to change in your game? What what with the clubs that you are changing? Uh, somebody's like like Jim right. said, if you're hitting a low ball, and uh, you know Judge Smales comes up to you and says, "Okay, I I'm hitting a low ball. I, I I need to hit it higher." Then you you know what they're trying to achieve, and you you immediately know what what you what changes you need to make with their current right. clubs. Right. Yeah. One of the things we have to watch out, or you know, everybody as you get into fittings. You may see somebody, you know, either putting or, or taking the full swing, and you may – you got to watch out and say, I know what would benefit this player, but it may not be what they're looking for. So, it's again, it's very important to always key in on the goal and then say – when once you get there, you say, okay, did we achieve your goal? Is that what you like? You like that flight? Now – do you think that you'd like to maybe make it better and right. give us examples of what direction? Uh, but you definitely, again, going in line with what Jim has been talking about, uh, you know, setting those goals, having a mission, what's, what's our, where are we going to march to for that, that fitting? And that way you, you can hit it. Right. Okay. I see a, a question uh, from Scott. He said, what are the best putter characteristics for radial strokes? And same question for a linear stroke. Yeah. So if you're a uh, radial, meaning a, a person that arcs the putter, right? Um, mm -hmm. You're going to want a heel shafted putter, something that is uh, got some toe hang. Uh, if you think about Tiger Woods, uh, he opens and closes the putter a ton. He's got about – he aims to the right, and he opens his face like eight degrees. You would never put him in a face balance putter because that doesn't match his stroke. 
A face balance putter is for a guy who takes the putter back straight, stands very close to the ball, and has, has no face rotation. Now, that being said, if you got a guy that's taking the putter back and he's, and he's hooding the club and he's closing the face and then he's blocking it coming through, you might give him a putter that's going to allow him to open and close the putter a little more and a little easier. So, um, yeah, if you've got a radial stroke, and it also depends on can you aim? I mean, what do you can this person aim with the putter they have? And so you really do have to take a take a look at that. Um, some people like the putter they have, but they can't they don't aim it, they don't aim it well. And then they end up what ends up happening is they aim way to the left or way to the right, and then they end up building in this huge compensation. Now, if they can repeat that every time. Then you, you don't change. You might change their setup, but you don't change their club. So how consistent are they? Um, do they hit the ball in the center of the club face? But like you said, a radial stroke versus a linear stroke, um, you want something with a little more face balance. I'm sorry, a little more toe hang. Okay. Um, uh, what question was I going to ask? Um, now, uh, when we get towards uh, just products in the industry now, uh, and you you were saying like uh, just they're initially at setup, they're they're offline uh, with the Callaway Triple Track with uh, the two red lines on the outside and the blue line in the uh, inside, especially with the golf ball. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, when I was at the Callaway uh, seminar, I was I was four inches offline with uh, just the traditional putter without the line. Uh, then I got a, a two ball blade. I got to about an inch and a half offline, and then they, they threw down the golf ball. And uh, after I lined up the ball with the hole and the club, I was right on point. Um, and I, I heard a story where they, they did this at a, a PGA Tour event um, years ago, just, and this was without sight lines in early 90s. Uh, they said almost all the tour players were – offline from the hole for just a regular 10 foot putt and then there, there's only one or two uh two guys that were right on line and i think they, they mentioned it was uh like freddie couples and um might have been uh jeff jeff magger uh i'm familiar with the names but they, they said even with the tour pros when they're setting up to uh the hole even they're even offline as well yeah. so. everybody has an aiming bias and um There's nobody that lines up perfectly. And the difference is the tour players aren't offline as much when they set up and their stroke is a little more consistent. So, you know, here's the, 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 the honest truth is if the face is more than one degree open or closed from 10 feet and you don't read the putt, right, you're going to correctly, you're going to miss it. Um, uh, So, you know, you got to get that club face within one degree. And if you're already set up two or three degrees off, uh, you know, right or left, you've got to really make, make a compensation uh, to get, to get the, the ball online. So, you know, I, I really think that not everybody's going to agree on this, but, you know, like if you talk to some putting experts, they'll say, uh, it doesn't matter where you aim. It matters the speed and, and how solid you hit it and you pick the line for the speed that you've already picked and you'll you'll just instinctively hit the ball there on the right line but but what if you've got a 10 or what if you got a five foot putt that's straight and you consistently can't aim the putter and you're missing three out of five from five feet well then you got a problem you're definitely not consistent and you need you need to make some technical changes um so you know, tour players, they're already really good. They don't need to have a whole lot of changes. You might change their, their setup or something, but, you know, most of the players that we work with, they take the putter outside, they loop it, they, their weights, you know, like if you're weight shifting all over the place, your putter could loop, you know, you might hit it on the toe, you know, any number of things. So the more technically sound you can get somebody and the better quality the, the putter fitting, um, or the better that club fits the person, the better chance they have of, of, of you know, making a good stroke. Yeah, it's a, I, again, yeah, I think you nailed it. 
uh, you said it in there, just want to elaborate what Jen said was, once you find their pattern, then go ahead and fit them to that pattern. Yeah. Now, uh, also I see uh, Scott added, uh, can you discuss the parallax con concept? I've never even heard of the parallax, uh, parallax concept, but uh, do you know? Well, any, well parallax is, 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 is um, okay. So some people, depending on your eye dominance, some people are right eye dominant, some people are left eye dominant. The first thing you've got to do is determine which eye is your dominant eye. Um, and so your aiming bias is going to be based on your dominant eye. Um, and as far as parallax is concerned, um, I've worked with uh, Dr. Craig Farnsworth. I don't know if you guys, if you don't know who he is, uh, you definitely want to look this guy up because he, Dr. Farnsworth uh, is, he's an optometrist by training, but he's also a, a, a talented uh, golf coach. It's where the position or the direction of an object appears different when viewed from different positions is what. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but some people like they view things and they think it's one place and it's not, it's actually somewhere else. Um, yeah. Like right now, if, if you were to just like stare at the wall or, or stare at, wherever obviously dan i don't want you to do that because you're in the car uh but like if you look at the wall and you focus on uh you focus on like a small area close your right eye and then you close your left eye it shifts over just to, just like maybe like right. a, an inch right. so, yep yeah so that's what basically what you're trying to uh yeah trying to discuss so yes. It's the, it's the perceived change uh, in a position of an object uh, from two different places. Um, so, you know, how does that relate to golf? Um, well, basically we have two eyes, right? And so one eye is usually the dominant eye. And so when you look at Jack Nicklaus, you know, why did Jack turn his head to the right? Well, the answer was he's a right-handed player with a left eye dominant. And why did he open his stance? Well, he liked to look at the golf ball and the cup at the same time in his peripheral vision. So, um, and it, in parallax, you know, it, it, it's inversely proportional to distance. So there's more parallax uh, the further away you are versus the, the uh, closer you are. The perceived distance of an object. So let's say, I'll just do an example. Let's say Jeff, Jeff hits, uh, I say, Je all right, Jeff, I want you to hit a 30 foot putt. Okay. And I want you to close your eyes, hit the putt and tell me whether you're long or short. And Jeff hits 10 putts and they're all short. Well, his perceived distance of 30 feet is incorrect. His brain thinks 30 feet is really not 30 feet. Uh, uh, so I don't know if that, if that answers the question, but um, it's, it's, the, it's a perceived dis, uh, distance of an object. Um, now, now, how can you improve the perceived distance? Uh, uh, that, could, could that be something you can work yeah, on on, yeah. The, on the putting green? Yeah, so what you need to do is walk off your distances and your eyes will um, start to understand what 30, 30 feet is. You know, now walk off. Say, well, uh, you keep going, keep going. Yeah, yeah. that's I, it. That was all I had, yeah. Well, now say if you, do, if you try to do a routine where, you know, you're playing at, at different courses, if you're just, you know, play at public tracks or if you're a tournament player, uh, to try to understand how the greens are rolling in terms of uh, – different strokes if you were to line up like two or three balls and you just take it to your back toe and go just a, a little bit past your your front toe and you are able to see okay that stroke is getting me seven feet so i know that this stroke is a seven foot putt and then right. you, you go a little bit farther back from your back foot and 
perform another stroke and you say, okay, that's, that's a 10 foot stroke. Is, is that a good exercise to work it on is. in terms of it getting is. deep distance? Yep. Okay. Excellent. Yep. Yeah. I, um, I would say that if you've got a beginner golfer and he's hitting a four foot putt, you know, you see this with kids and they, and they smash it, right. They hit it, this four foot putt, they hit it 20 mm -hmm. feet. Right. And, and they take it yeah. back, you know, like a two feet. So you just, you know, like what I tell the, I put a ruler on the ground for kids and I say, okay, take it back four inches and, and through four inches. How far did that go? And okay. Now take it back five inches and through five inches. How far did that go? Um, now there are variables, you know, like the speed of the putter, where you hit it on the face, the length of the stroke. Um, all of those are factors that influence distance. Uh, uh, so um, this question here with limited fitting equipment that is not available, how can you have a properly fit player? Um, well, the first thing is you have to, you have to look at their, their height and then their uh, wingspan, right? And you, and you measure, you know, all the companies have it. You can measure their, you know, distance from the, whatever the, the company that you're fitting with has a, has a, has a way to measure. But so, you know, like if you've got a person that's five foot six, they're not, you're not going to get, you're not going to put them in a standard length club. They're, you're going to put them in either a half inch or a quarter inch short. Now, if they're hitting the ball off the toe every time, you know, is that their swing or is that their club? Well, if you're coming outside in and you're swinging the club towards your body and you're chicken winging, you know, no fitting is going to help that, right? They need a golf lesson, but you don't want to tell them that, right? You just say, look, um, you know, I'm your instructor and I want to fit you for your clubs, but we're not ready for a fitting yet. You know, let's, let's do some lessons first. Now, if you're just fitting a random person and they came here and they're like, look, I got a thousand bucks I want to drop, uh, fit me for the clubs. Well, then I'm just going to fit them as best I can for the swing that they have. But I'm a big believer in fitting someone um, for the swing that they want or that you want them to have versus the swing that they have right now. But, you know, not everybody's my student. So if I got a guy that wants a, a, a comprehensive fitting for everything, then, and, you know, he's hitting, it, he's hitting it off the toe. Well, I'll give him a club that's a little bit longer, maybe a quarter inch longer. Yeah, that's why I asked like the importance with uh, the use of lie angle during a fitting because you might just see uh, a player, they're set up to the ball and you, you see their hands are, are so low, uh, they're, they're lower than where they should be and that's why they're hitting it off or on the um, heel of the club and then you might see they're, they're set up with their hands raised and then, oh, that, that's why you're hitting it on the toe of the club. Let's position our hands here and have them perform a few swings. Right. Uh, so do you, do you encourage some instruction during sure. the fitting and what's too much yeah. instruction? During yeah. Well, I wouldn't fitting? give them any swing thoughts, but I, I do believe setup situation is real important. So yeah, I would go over the setup for sure with them. You know, if you've got a guy that's like you said, his hands are down between his knees and uh, you know, I would definitely make that adjustment. I would say most people on the PGA Tour, the higher level players, um, are really not the people we want to be looking at to fit, uh, you know, Mrs. Havacamp who swings 65 miles an hour, right? But, but by and large, um, if I've got a person that um, is looking for distance, I'm going to try to fit them in something with a little bit more loft if they're a slow swing speed player and something that's going to give you kick point is a big deal. Like, you know, if you got a Diamana X flex and the person swinging 90 miles an hour uh, and they're hitting ground balls and they can't get it off the ground. Well, the golf club is too much torque or doesn't have enough torque, which is the resistance to twist and doesn't have enough loft. Cause remember shafts bend backwards and forwards and the amount that twists the shaft twists. If you have a low torque shaft and it's very tip stiff, and you got a person that can't hit it in the air, you got to give them something that's a mid kick or even kicks up towards the end of the club uh, to get it up in the air. So, you know, knowing the shaft torque and knowing the shaft characteristics um, is a big deal too. Yeah, I see uh, Scott had an additional question. Uh, he wanted okay. to know how to articulate the difference between a side on player 
and one that covers the ball. So what's the difference between a side-on player and one that covers the ball? Yeah, yeah. So Mike Adams, uh, Bioswing Dynamics. You know, so if you've got a side-on guy, right, he, you, you test him in his club, and when he takes it back, his palm is up, he's a side-on player. If you take it back and he's got a really bad right shoulder and he can't externally rotate, uh, he might go back with the face shut and the right elbow really high. Um, so what was the question, side-on player versus? Uh, uh, one that covers the ball. Oh, so side cover. Um, so if you've got a side-on player, right, when, you swing, when you're teaching them, okay, how are they going to square the face? So if you've got a guy that can rotate the club going back, okay, and then you've got a guy that's side cover, he's got a little bit less rotation, you know, the guy that, that is coming back with a steeper plane is going to have more verticals. He's going to be standing up. Now, why is that? Because if the shaft's coming down vertical, he's going to hit it. He's going to, he's going to ground out behind the ball. So he's got to stand up more through the ball. There was a guy on tour called Peter Senior. And he, he was from Australia. And he took the club back very steep. And he stood up through the ball. Well, he had a very vertical swing. So guys that don't have a lot of rotation, Nicholas. Nicholas took it back with a high right elbow. He didn't have a lot of rotation. Take a guy like Zach Johnson. He's not a side-on guy. He's an under guy. So under guys are going to swing more into out, and they're going to go out to the right. Guys that are steeper are going to, are going to cover the ball more. So they're going, to, they're going to unwind from the top. They're going to get their upper body more on top of the ball. So the, the way they release the club and the way that they square the face is different based on, based on their position of their right arm. So external rotation of the forearm, external rotation of the shoulder, how much you can do that is going to correlate to where the club is at the top. It's also going to correlate to where the club is coming down. I hope that helps answer that question. So a guy like Zach Johnson, he's a shut face player. His path is six degrees to the right. He's six degrees into out, but his face is always three degrees close to his path. He hits push draws. He swings out to the right. His, he doesn't cover it. He's not a guy who's getting his upper body on top. He's got, because his club face is shut, he's got a tilt. So he's going to swing out to the right. Same with Dustin Johnson. Uh, he's got a shut club face, but he's a different player. He is swinging more to the left. He's hitting cuts. So he's a guy that's a shut face, and he's covering it more. He's getting his hands left more, and he's covering it more with his trunk to do that. Excellent. Now, um, I've seen this may not, this may be just a, a minor factor with, with clubs, but I'll, I'll see uh, some members come in and, and they have just a, a standard golf pride tour velvet on their, on their irons. And, you know, they, they grabbed one of their friends clubs that had uh, a midsize uh, golf pride multi-compound uh, and they are ready uh, twi or twist the club face a little bit too much and then they have a, a closed club face and that's helping them square it up because they're not rotating their wrist as much with a mid-size grip. But with the change in the weight in the grip, mm -hmm. does that play a big factor yeah. in the performance of the club or is it just minimal? No, it, it does. You know, like for me, I'll just say this, a counterbalance club doesn't work for me because I like to feel the club weight of the club in the head. I like to sense the head of the club. And if you put me in a counterbalance putter, I don't like it uh, because it takes the weight out of the head. And for me, it takes feel out of the head. Um, and the same may be the case for, so you really need to ask that question. Uh, All right. You really need to ask that question of the player. I don't know what, what Dan, what do you think about that? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, it's, again, it's a player, player uh, preference, you know, what you ask them, uh, you know, are, some people are very mechanical. Some people are very field players. And yeah. The field player is going to not, not want you to take away the, the feeling of being able to feel that head, even with the putter. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm the same way as Jim. I, I like to know – I like to feel my, my, my club head. Uh, but there's some people that, you know, they're very 
I find it more in the, especially with the people with, uh, we'll talk putters real quick, like is, is the people who have more of a, a back and through stroke versus yeah. the, the arc stroke. They, they like that, that counterbalance uh, setup works better for them. Yeah. But that's them. And again, it's player specific. Right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Is there uh, any other things that? Uh... Uh, no, I think uh, um, I just got a email or actually I don't think uh, Evan joined in, but I did get an email from uh, another PGM uh, recently elected uh, PGM member. I just wanted to read what um, he recommended in terms of uh, finishing up book work and especially during, oh, okay. uh, during the season, because it's, it's, uh, it's difficult do doing book work when you're working eight to 10 hours a day. And, you know, last thing you want to do is hop on the com computer for two or three hours to, get some things done, but uh, he just recommended that time management, depending on when you enrolled in the program, uh, just really uh, manage your time wisely. And, you know, just an hour, hour a day, just maybe just fill out one, one question once a day. And um, once you complete your season, as soon as you know it, uh, you know, you're, you're done with uh, uh, the entire book work. Um, and use uh and in terms of like fi uh, financing it, a lot of uh, a lot of PGM students are you know have difficulty uh, you know paying for these uh, seminars. Uh, I mean, the Mid Atlantic uh, has a, a scholarship uh, available, but that's after testing, and that's pretty much after you know they they drop thousands of dollars uh, to do level two or level three. Um, but uh, if they can use some sort of a, a fundraiser from uh, membership uh, over at Wampanoag Country Club, where I worked at, we had a, um, and a <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we had an assistance raffle. So we had a, a list of uh, prizes that they could that they could win from golf clubs to um, shoes to just balls, uh, maybe uh, a package of two lessons, and you know we we were able to just sell raffle tickets and after we distributed prizes some just wanted to just give us a uh like a hundred bucks or so because they knew we were furthering our education um but it it really assisted us because right at the end of the assistance raffle we had almost enough to put us through a level so it, it does depend on if the if the board or the committee approves of that so um and it, it does help a lot so you can possibly discuss that with your director of golf, head uh, golf professional or the GM to see if uh, they, that you're able to do that. But it, it does help you um, along the way financially. Uh, let's see the other things he uh, mentioned, he, he mentioned, remember your, your three F's family, uh, friends and uh, your facility. So uh, you just said, always make sure, make sure of your priorities too. Uh, you know, your book work may be a priority, but also just focus on spending time with uh, your friends and your family first, just to kind of keep your sanity, so to speak, amongst your job. Uh, and uh, just it, uh, basically just try not to overwork yourself. You overwork yourself, you're not going to perform your best and, you know, provide the greatest of answers uh, in your work experience portfolio next thing you know you're going to have to repeat that uh level repeat your uh work experience portfolio so just take your time as well don't rush it they give plenty of time uh to complete a level uh and it's it's not a race uh and just utilize your time wisely but also you know try to give some time for for yourself and and don't don't overwork yourself uh and that's that's the message i got from um, one of the recently elected pga members from the Connecticut section who I played in a few tournaments and his, his father was a, a, a longtime PGA member. So, uh, you know, it's some important information in there. Um, yeah. 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 Balance is extremely important. Uh, you know, even if you're um, a single guy and you're spending all your time focused on golf, you need balance in your life. You need other interests. And, um, 
you know, one of the things that I think is really important, like I was saying earlier, is, is um, for me, like I was working seven days a week and um, it's just unhealthy, period. And you're not going to be any good to your people if you don't, if you don't take the time to get away from it. And, uh, you know, I take Sundays off now and, and um, I've just found with balance, you're going to be much better at what you do. And um, it gives you time to think about and analyze your, you got to be open to criticism. You know, you, uh, as you get older, you'll learn this, but um, you know, it's okay uh, to have someone else critique what you're doing. Um, I would encourage everybody to video themselves, given a presentation, video themselves for a golf lesson. And you're not going to like what you see most of the time. I can tell you, like when I videoed myself and I watched myself give a lesson, I was like, that's the worst lesson I've ever heard. It's terrible. And, you know, it's like, uh, so you have to have an open mind and be willing and, and flexible and open to hearing other people. And like I said, the older you get, the less you know, uh, and the less you realize, you know. And so even if you hear somebody that you think, wow, that's just crazy, I would never do that, you know, listen to what they have to say and why they do it. And if they're getting results, it's just one more way to, to describe something to somebody to give them a feel. Uh, it's not going to hurt you to have that, that tool in your quiver. Um, so um, I remember as a young teacher going to seminars and thinking, man, this guy's out of his effing mind. And uh, next thing I know, I'm quoting him. Uh, or I'm saying I'm doing something because I was in a position where I didn't have any answers. And I said, well, maybe it works. And you know what? Sometimes it does. So, um, you know, the biggest thing is, is, is like I said, I think, I think you've got to formulate a vision, a strategy uh, for what you're trying to do with people. I mean, the most important thing is uh, building a relationship with that person, empowering that golfer to reach the goals that they want to reach and making sure you're listening to what they're having to say. I mean, don't impose your will on that person in front of you. Um, let them tell you what they want and make sure you ask really good questions and you listen to them. And then you repeat back what you hear. Clarify. Let me, let me make sure I understand what you're saying here. And, and when you can do that and you know that they think you care when, when you, when you give that impression that, Hey, you're the most important thing right now. Don't, don't have any distractions uh, around you. Look that person in the eye and uh, make sure that uh, you, they know you're really interested in them, you, you'll, you'll do fine. I would also encourage you to establish some core beliefs. Core beliefs are, you know, who are you as a person? Um, and what are your values as a person? Um, and, uh, you know, why do you, why are you, why do you do what you do? You know, why, why do you get up every morning and why are you a golfer? professional what, what what is it that you love about what, and um what is the passion and what are you trying to get across to the people that you come in contact with every day i think that uh that's hugely important you know standing on the lesson tee and and just collecting money uh and telling the next guys you know your time's up uh is not necessarily transformational it's more transactional and uh People can see through that, believe me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you also, you, even if you are a club professional, but, you know, you're getting into the business, you're doing more and more teaching, and, you know, you know you're running a, a, a ladies' event the following day, and you, you need to make preparations, and, you know, you get a, a call, hey, can, can we do a, a playing lesson or a one-hour lesson, and, it, you know, it's 3 o'clock in the, in the afternoon, and, you are available. There's other people's in the other people in the shop who can uh, watch the shop for you. You you got to be able to say, you know, sorry, I'm not available. I'm I'm preparing for an event. Of course, you may have an hour to uh, to give a lesson, but that means you're going to be at work for an extra hour. And you got to say to yourself, you know what? I just can't give a lesson. I can't think about the uh, sixty to hundred dollars that I'm going to make just for that one hour. I got to also think about where my feet are and know that I'm going to be putting on a successful event. So right. you have to be able to 
turn down lessons uh, just to the fact that, you know, you got to think about your facility first. Right. Or make time, you know, based on your schedule, say, Hey, look, here's what I'm, here's, here's when I'm available. Would it be, uh, would it be possible for you to meet me on such and such a time in a day? Uh, I'm, you know, I've got, I've got some other priorities I have to take care of right now, but I'd love to meet with you on this time and day. Let's do it then. And you know, what can they say? They're probably going to say yes. More often than not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because they come to you for, for a lesson, they're going to be willing to do it at another time. Exactly. You know, and, uh, um, Nobody cares what you know unless they know you care. And if, if you take the interest and time to say, hey, I'd love to do it then, and, uh, and you know, um, but be confident, you know, say, hey, look, you know what? I know I can help you. Just let me, uh, let me put you down at this at such and such time and day. And, and I know I can, I can, I can give you, uh, give you my full attention and, you know, I can help you. Great. Now, uh, if we could pop into the group discussion, um, slide sure. i know uh, there's a, a couple questions that uh scott may have and uh hopefully tyler or valerie uh have uh but scott if you can you can unmute your mic if you'd like and uh kind of ask uh jim or dan uh some questions you may have uh that weren't answered or just that just came to you so if you want to get off uh mute you can uh ask whatever question you'd like unless you're on a computer that doesn't have a mic they make those <laughs> it might just be like one of those uh computers that in the office i know that we don't have a mic in our computers in in the office at green spring um i don't see him getting off but uh you did ask uh, assume the side uh assume the side on player can benefit from flatter lie angle if left misses are a problem yeah so, absolutely like I said, I think lie angle flatter is better than more upright. Um, there's been studies done on that. Um, if you got a club that's too upright, it's say it's two degrees too upright, it's going to go offline more than a club that's two degrees too flat. Um, so I would say flatter is better. All right. I think I think golf clubs have gotten you know since I started in the business back in the dinosaur days, the clubs were short and. Uh, <laughs> You know, they were a lot flatter than they are nowadays. Now clubs are longer. There's no loft on them. And, uh, you know, the club companies keep making a six iron 28 degrees and telling everybody they're hitting it further. So, yeah. Taylorman started doing that. And now it's longer. Yeah. Just compare compare specs with with the uh, early 2000s and, and to now because it's all, it was all about distance, distance. And that's the only way yeah. to change yep. that is the equipment because there's only so much club head speed you can have on a golf ball to really increase your distance that's why the tour players hit it so far is their club head speed is one or is like 110 111 and that's why they're hitting it so far there's only so much a golf ball can do and until it can really get more distance and that's just it's it's plain and simple more club head speed that that's how you get yeah. more distance. you're not going to get more distance uh out of the golf ball unless you're getting into triple digits right well as harvey Pennick said the woods the woods are full of long hitters the woods are full of long hitters so you know uh distance means nothing if every you know nine, seven or eight out of ten of the balls go you know offline where you can't find it right so mm -hmm. The long drive guys, I don't see any long drive guys number one on the PGA Tour in money. No, I just see uh, all those uh, Instagram posts from um, – God, that, that guy, uh, Kyle uh, – Berkshire. 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 Yeah. I just see, I just see his Instagram posts of uh, whacking drivers at the range, but then I'll see him on, on the course and he's hitting six iron off the tee. He's actually – you know, making a good swing, but I mean, his swing with a six iron looks like a 14, 15 handicap. It's just, it, yeah. it's not consistent. It's out of control, but I mean, he's got it down to a science with the driver. Yeah. 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 He built, he built his swing for swing speed. Yeah. You, yep. could, you, you could tell with lifting his left leg or his left foot and his right foot off the ground three, 
three or four times. You're not going to see uh, Dustin Johnson doing that or, or you know, Kevin Na or, you know, Jason Duffner or any, any of those guys doing that. But it was amazing seeing him at the PGA show hitting into a simulator. I thought that ball was just going to go right through the screen. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah. Actually, Jamie, Jamie Sadlowski actually did that with Michael Breed on the Golf Channel. He was uh, talking about how he gets more club head speed, talking about his swing, hits his driver, boom, goes right through the right through the screen off the wall, and and it was it was too funny. I was just like, did I actually just see that? It went right through the screen. <laughs> totally backfired on Michael Breed. He was just, he was kind of stunned for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we're. Uh, if is there anything else uh, you'd like to add, Jim or Dan, um, or uh, um, Christine, in in regards to uh, anything that we discussed, or uh, anything coming up with the MAPGA, information about future tournaments or events coming up, um, with COVID still being around and it being lifted at several clubs. I mean, I know half our section is is technically closed. But anything we should be aware of? Sure. I would just encourage everybody to um, be on the lookout for communications, particularly uh, the weekly news and notes uh, newsletter that gets sent on Tuesdays. That's where you're going to get a lot of the up-to-date information and announcements about um, tournaments that have been postponed and their rescheduled dates, um, and as well as visiting um, the website as well. That's the best place to check. Um, it will have the most up-to-date information and uh, we'll look forward to getting back to the tournament season when it's when it's safe um, and we'll make those announcements when they're available. All right, excellent. Yeah, so just the last announcement, next, our last uh, Associate Development Day will be showing level one for Monday, May 11th. Uh, we'll have uh, Todd, uh, available to answer any uh, work experience portfolio questions or anything with testing. Uh, teaching and coaching will be presented by Kevin Tanner from Golf Tech. Um, I'll have uh, Drew Falvey for, as the recently elected PGA member uh, to discuss uh, anything that assisted him getting through the process. And uh, Dan will be uh, available uh, to talk with us again um, as it looks like we'll have some uh, introduction to teaching and coaching. I remember on that side, it's uh, just beginner club alteration. So if we can, you know, give some uh, shortcuts on how to get into that aspect of, uh, of the business, just to sh just increase your knowledge, that would be great. But other yeah, than that, right. Tim, thank you very much for, for host or for speaking today, Dan, thank you very much for, for, uh, you know, joining in as well. I, I greatly appreciate it. Appreciate you guys and everything yeah. you're doing. Yeah, no problem. If you ever need any help, let me know. I'm uh, happy to help. Yeah, and I'll, I'll hopefully try to come your way and just watch one of your uh, one of your lessons. I tried sure. doing it with Brad Redding, but I wasn't able to get there. Or our schedules didn't line up, but if I were able to be uh, – uh, be able to watch one of your lessons that would be great and then I'll I'll film one of my lessons and and see how good or bad I do <laughs> so yeah it's it's worth doing yeah. it's definitely worth it yeah all right great well uh we'll just top off the zoom and then we'll do golf golf operations for 11 o'clock uh there's the additional zoom link in the email I sent out um so I'll see you all uh, in about a half hour Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Take Bye -bye. care.